Hey everyone, it's Mr. Gan. Um, back again doing another video lecture, this time on population genetics. Let's get started. So, population genetics, um, one of the first things you're always going to read or learn about in population genetics is a gene pool. Um, you know, a gene pool is where all the genetic variation of a population is stored, right? Um, and it's a gene pool is a com is the combined alleles of all the individuals in a population. And when you're looking at the individuals of a population, you generally look at something we call allele frequency, which is a measure of how common a certain allele in a population is. So certain um, alleles are going to have a higher allele frequency meaning there's going to be more individuals with those alleles, and some are going to have a lower or a smaller allele frequency, meaning there's going to be a less number of individuals in the population with that gene or allele. All right, so populations. The definition of a population is a group of individuals that belong to the same species and live in the same area, right? They live in the same habitat, they're all drawing from the same resources, and they are also reproducing together, right? They are mating within the population. Populations can be large or small in nature. Um, as you can imagine, um, individuals that um, are organisms that are at risk of extinction have much smaller populations than other organisms that are not at risk of extinction. So they could be large or small. Evolution as genetic change. Sources of genetic variation in individuals include recombination through sexual reproduction, crossing over, mutations, and something we call horizontal gene transfer. For those who don't know what horizontal gene transfer, it's different from what we normally talk about. When we talk about sexual reproduction and the passing of genetic material, that is called vertical gene transfer. But horizontal gene transfer is from two is it is when two individuals exchange their genetic material just like directly by forming a connection. This is generally seen in bacteria. Um, for example, if you had one bacteria here, so one bacteria, and it f formed a connection and horizontally exchanged its genetic inf information um, with a, another individual. This is done through bacteriophages or plasmids, and it's actually the reason why we have problems with bacteria that are becoming more resistant to once relatively potent and effective antibiotics. Um, and through horizontal gene transfer, it's the reason why there's a rise in antibiotic resistance. Sources of genetic variation in populations include mutations, migration, both immigration and emigration, as well as natural selection. We all know that natural selection acts on the phenotypes of individuals, meaning like the physical traits that we see in individuals, which then, um, due to whether they're advantageous or disadvantageous, um, determines what alleles get passed on to the next individuals or next generations. Um, Genetic de definition of evolution. Evolution is any change in the relative frequency of the alleles in a population's gene pool, right? So it's that allele frequency that see and whether evolution is the change in those frequencies over time. The question is, evolution occurs in populations and not individuals. Why is that? Natural selection and evolution doesn't affect or doesn't work on individuals because in individuals there is no difference between right there's no variation between traits right an individual only has one type of trait and natural selection doesn't work because there's no like competition between the selection between a trait and an individual because there's only one right versus in a population you see a variation you see multiple traits in a population, and that's what natural selection works upon. So that's why we say evolution occurs in populations and not in individuals. The next note is that genetic equilibrium means that allele frequencies remain constant. 
as you as you know what equilibrium means means it's very constant there is no um, push or pull um, when it comes to alleles frequency um, this is very unlikely I won't say exactly why but take a moment pause this video if you need to and try to hypothesize a guess uh, what is it about the um, transfer alleles or the transfer of genetic material that um, may result or not result in genetic equilibrium. We know that genetic equilibrium is very unlikely, meaning that it's very unlikely that in a population all the allele frequencies are going to remain constant over time. What are the what are the factors that may change that? And why is it unlikely that it doesn't happen or why is it unlikely that it remains constant? So try to answer that, prepare an answer, and we'll talk about it in class. So we're going to talk a little bit about more con complex evolution topics. One of those topics is something we call gene flow. Gene flow is the movement of alleles from one population to another. And this is generally because an like animal or organism can freely move between populations. Gene flow increases the genetic variation of the receiving population. If you imagine an individual that can move from one population, it's going to bring its own alleles, and sometimes they're different. So that why that means it's going to increase that variation we see in that new population. Yet when gene flow occurs between neighboring populations, it actually keeps our gene pool quite similar, because if there's only two populations and they're just moving back and forth between them, the genetic variation changes, but the gene pool never changes that much. It remains very similar because you're only moving between neighboring populations. A lack of gene flow increases the chances that two populations will evolve into different species. If there was no gene flow and there's no change, even slightly, in genetic variation, because of evolution and natural selection, those two populations are eventually just going to continue to um, diverge and may even eventually become two different species. And we'll talk about speciation and different isolation events at the end of this, uh, end of this presentation. Another um, topic we talk about, you may have heard of, is something called genetic drift. What genetic drift is, is when it refers to a random change or a random event that changes the allele frequency. Um, you generally see this in very small populations. It's quite prominent or strong, as we might say, um, in populations that have less than 100 breeding pairs. Um, sometimes you'll hear terms like genetic bottleneck or founder's effect. These are all examples of genetic drift. Unfortunately, genetic drift actually decreases the genetic diversity over time. Um, this is because, because of some event or some change not all alleles are actually passed down in each generation. Those alleles are often limited and not seen in subsequent generations. One of them, as I said, is called a bottleneck effect. Um, this is occurring when there's some type of event or um, some type of occurrence that drastically or greatly reduces the size of a population. Um, for example, if you look at this picture right here, we have this first bottle is the original population. As you can see, there's some green ones, some red ones, some white individuals. However, after an event such as turning the bottle and trying to pour out part of that population through, the, through its bottleneck, um, there's only going to be a, a little bit of a surviving population, right? It reduced the size of the population. And a bottleneck refers to when that surviving population is not a perfect representation of the original population. As you can see in this third cup, there's only a couple white and red. There are no green like spheres or balls in that surviving population. And it's a, it's a type of um, genetic drift. One example of this is the overhunting of northern elephant seals in the 1800s. And actually, by the 1890s, the population was re reduced to only 20 individuals. And those 20 did not represent the genetic diversity of the original population. You know, that's what that picture describes up top, is that by the surviving population, 
right? That green is not there and it's not representative of the original population. The next effect is called the founder effect. Um, this is a type of genetic drift that occurs after a small number of individuals colonize a new area. And these, this original group, these founders, um, once again, do not represent um, the original population, and they're often very different. One example of this is these people right here. This is individuals of the new old order Amish community. Um, they came over from Europe, from Europe and settled in the east coast of North America, of the United States, around like Pennsylvania. Um, and those were, you know, selected individuals, and they, it was non-random. Those individuals, you know, were, were not necessarily a random um, group of individuals, and they actually saw that there's a high number of individuals with dwarfism, which, you know, may not have um, been an accurate representative of the entire population that was from, that was in Europe. So um, that's an example of a founder effect. So we're going to talk a bit about speciation now. Um, speciation is the process in evolution in which new species are formed. Um, generally, this occurs due to some sort of reproductive isolation, which I'll talk about in a little bit, between populations of the same species, meaning there's some sort of barrier or limitation that results in an isolation and the species can no longer reproduce with each other. Two populations must be separated for a long time. As we know in evolution, evolution takes a long time. You know, it takes, it, it, there needs to be time in order for, and enough tough time to, to see a difference between them in order to evolve them into two different species. So the first one we're gonna talk about is, is geographical, geographic isolation. Um, this is a term when we have a population of animals, plants, or other organisms that are separated from exchanging their genetic material with other organisms of the same species. Typically, this type of isolation is a result in some type of accident or coincidence. Sometimes it could be a physical barrier, um, could be a man-made barrier that limits, um, limits the ability of these two species and are separated, isolated these species from reproducing with each other. Um, I left you an example, you can read that over and ask questions in class if you don't understand it. The next one is behavioral isolation. This refers to the isolation result as like certain behaviors that individuals of the species um, do. In most cases, this happens during like a courtship or like mating season. Um, the example down below is about fireflies and how females only respond to signals flashed by their own species. So if you were a male of a different species and you did not have, you did not, you know, exude the same, the perfect flashing sequence of lights, you're not going to be able to reproduce with the species, with the females of a different species because females are so selective. So the next one is temporal, temporal isolation. This is a, another reproductive isolating mechanism in which their members of a different of different species mate at different times of the year or in different seasons or there's a like a limited amount of time in which reproduction in the passing of genetic material can occur. Um, the example we gave you about orchid flowers that fl each flower blooms only for a single day which they open at dawn and wither by nightfall. As you can imagine that's a small amount of time in order to be pollinated and to pass on their genetic material and you know reproduce and so that short amount of time is a form of an isolated mechanism right it isolates their ability to reproduce the last one is mechanical isolation um, it's like the idea that if you need a hammer you know you can't necessarily use a wrench all the time right this is true for animals that mate through sexual reproduction Without compatible sex organs, individuals of different species, despite even being somewhat closely related, will not be able to mate and produce offspring. So if you do not have the right sex organ, you know, you're not going to be able to reproduce. And it's actually biological mechanical isolation. And that's obviously because you can't reproduce, you know, it won't 
allow you um, to like converge into the same species and it's only ever going to allow those species to diverge into two separate species. Um, the example he gave you was about plants and how there's an actual correct shape um, and if that shape for the pollinator is and for the pollen transfer is not perfect they're not the flowers aren't going to be fertilized and so that case the shape is the barrier. So here we have um, examples um, for you to decide um, what type of isolation each of them refers to. Um, I'll read them over. The first one is the male blue-footed booby performs a very elaborate dance that shows off his bright blue feet. This helps him identify to female boobies as a potential mate. Um, take a moment and somewhere on your skeleton notes write down whether you think this is a geographical isolation or a behavioral isolation or temporal or mechanical isolation. So take a moment, write it down, write down in a short little sentence about what it is. Um, the next one is an earthquake causes two populations to become separate from each other. Over time, each species experiences genetic makeup specific only to their smaller, less diverse populations. Is this an example of behavioral, geographical, temporal, or mechanical isolation? The last one is frogs calls. frog calls are very unique to each species in both pitch and pattern. These specific vocalizations create reproductive barriers for frogs that are not of the same species. Once again, take a moment and take a guess, write down an answer for whether you think this is geographical, behavioral, temporal, or mechanical isolation. And then, of course, we'll talk about this in class. Um, if you don't know, if you have trouble distinguishing between those four different types of isolation, make sure you write it down. Make a note on your skeleton notes, and we'll come talk about it um, in class. So this is the last slide. This is just some ter terms or words you need to understand. Um, you know, these are both words that we talked about in this video lecture as well as in class. Um, if you do not understand any of these words, or you're kind of you're kind of hazy, you're fuzzy about the definition. Um, write them down, and then bring them to class, and we could definitely talk about it. You know, I'll help you um, understand it much more in detail. As always, like, comment, and subscribe for my video lectures. And um, if you have any suggestions, you know, I'm always open to suggestions. I want to make these video lectures you know, the best that I can. So if you have any, you have any questions or suggestions, come talk to me, you know, um, I definitely want to help improve this. So thank you for understanding and I will see you in class.